everybody? It's your girl Nita, your favorite diva, and I'm back. I know I've been gone for a little bit, and now I'm back with the jump off. Your girl was down and out for a little bit, but I am on the men. So excuse my absence. I am back and in full effect. And let me get this video out to you without further ado. This is season two, my thoughts on euphoria. Now let's get into it. Don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to comment on the video. And don't forget to subscribe. Okay? Okay. So, season two of Euphoria, this is your review. Okay, so this is the uh, overview. I don't want to really go over everything. We get Fez's backstory, Fez and Ashtray backstory. So, I definitely knew that we were going to get a book in with this because he was the fan favorite he didn't get his particular episode in season one and everybody you know at the end of season one where's fan story you know he ended up being a fan favorite and so we get fez's story you ask we shall deliver so sam said here you go there you go. So he lets you know what happened with Fez, his grandmother, how Ashtray came a part of the family. Let me tell you something. The grandmother ended up being a drug dealer. She ended up getting Fez from his from his father who was abusing him. Now, we don't know whether or not. Well, I don't know. Let me. You may know. I don't know. If you know, put it in the comments whether or not that was her son that she shot. Was it just somebody that she knew that she she shot? Like what? I don't know. So I didn't understand all of that. I assumed that that was her son that she shot and she took the baby from him. And I mean, not the baby. Fez was like, he looked like he was about mm, nine, eight, nine, ten. So um, grandma got you, baby. We about to go. But, but there's a big but. Grandma is not to be played with. One and two, she a drug dealer. So what? Okay, so we coming up on adolescence. We got this adolescent boy coming up with you, and then he sees what you're doing, and then next thing you know, he becomes a part of this organization. So naturally, being a product of his environment, he is, you know, in the game. So one day, Fez comes out into the kitchen and sees a baby. Look like 10 months, a year, sitting on the floor in his diaper. And let me tell you something about drug addicts. So she's a drug dealer or whatever. And what that looks like to me is that either something went down and the parents got killed and she took the baby or, or, shout out to Dave Chappelle, or the drug addict gave the baby away in um, you know, for some drugs or whatever. Sorry, you know, some cold mother gave him to me as collateral. He's also to the DM. Hey, can I get the, uh... Semen and blood is used actually in a satanic ritual. Uh, I'm gonna mess y'all head up with this in satanic rituals. She never came back to pick him I up. I know, I know. So, those, those are my two thoughts. Let me tell you something. A drug addict will do anything for the next hit. Hear me and hear me well. Any hole, any whatever, whatever you need to do to secure your next hit, that is what a drug addict does. And it is so, so scary. And that is kind of like the vibe that I was getting. Like it was never explained. The baby just was there. And it just ended up being there forever. And that baby name was Ashtray. How did he get his name? He got his name from sitting in the t in the sink, getting his bath, in his bubble bath, eating cigarette butts out the ashtray. That's Ashtray. Isn't that a cute story? It's cute. Anyway, so he came up and they're all in survival mode. You know, when you're in a drug game, you're in survival mode. All the time, head on the swivel, things is going down. And because of this, Ashtray has grown up in this environment where he is in survival mode. So you see him being rash. He's a child. He's rash. He does not think things out. He does not think things through. Um, yeah. Ashtray is not the one you want to mess with. And I would just leave it like that. I'm going to leave it like that. Ass mouse. 
Okay. All right. And then so now, kind of fast forward, we're going through some things that I just want to touch on. I want to touch on Miss Cassie. Baby, baby. I thought season one, Cassie was bad. The fall from grace was swift and hard. Baby, you go from McKay to Nate. Are you kidding me? Child cheese. I don't know. I, I almost felt like Nate was preying on her. He was like a predator trying to like knowing that she would be that person. And I, you know, I felt really, really bad for her in the beginning, but I'm like, why am I feeling bad for her? She is full on participating, full on concocting a story in her mind to justify her actions. And so, yeah, no, can't feel too sorry for you, Cassie, baby. So sorry. Not sorry. Okay. So anyway, she gets into this crazy relationship. Oh, did I forget to tell you that Nate is Maddie's ex, her best, Cassie's best friend, Maddie. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. So all of that is, is, is just Cassie come to the front. Come on school. School on up to the front. Hell is wrong with you girl <laughs> that's like what i wanted to do bitch i wanted to shake that bitch what is wrong you need a fucking exorcist uh, that girl i was livid but you know what i'm trying to tell you is that you know it's the euphoria of it all it's the feeling it's the feeling and when you're young like that you act on feelings and emotions not logic and just, I mean, it's just basically just trauma and you're growing up and just having these reactions and responses to things that are happening, good, bad, or indifferent, baby. But Cassie, I wanted to call you down to the front. Come on, come on. Let somebody lay hands on you, baby. You need that exorcist out of you. Messing with Nate. And that's why in that first episode, when she was um hunching with him, when she was sitting up there in that daggone bathroom hunching, and when Maddie came in there to use that bathroom and use a, a somebody else's wash rag because it wasn't no toilet paper bit. So first of all, the first layer is using someone's rag that you don't know where it been and you actually put it on your <laughs> and then cassie in the tub hiding she throws it back over into it and it falls right on cassie's face i said bitch that's what you get that is what you get <laughs> and then y'all remember in that episode uh uh little meach that plays in BMF on stars was actually making a cameo. He never came back. He never came back, but he did make a cameo in euphoria. And I was, I was, you know, happy to see him. So just to say that. Okay. So side note, I don't like what they did with Kat's character. There's some things going on behind the scenes, baby. Sam and Kat are not on the same page. She voiced her grievances from what I understand. Sam was like, okay, but he had a vision of where he was going to go and he wasn't able to course correct her, her um, storyline in order to keep Euphoria on track. Okay. So he kind of sidelined her. She's there but she's not there. There's also something that happened with McKay. Now, you know, that was the black guy that played in season one who was kind of like assaulted and he was like a football player and he was in college and they were in high school and something happened to him. And I believe he had a grievance about how that was portrayed and all of that. And so he was just like, eh. and so 
like I said, Sam has a vision for where this thing is going. He wasn't able to course correct. So, you know, McKay just kind of like disappeared and Kat was there, but she wasn't there. You know how that goes. Hopefully they're able to course correct because Kat's storyline in season one was one of my favorite storylines. And I was very, very disappointed um, to see her um, fade into the background because of what was going on. So anyway, I digress about that. I just want to give you a little background and I really, but Kat was one of my favorite storylines. I also did dig, um, what's the child name? Jules. Um, I, I dug her storyline as well. Um, not in a good way, but I thought it, it, it depicted um, that particular life um, in a manner that really made it feel real. You know what I'm saying? So really kind of brought that nasty stench of that life and how you have to, you know, deny yourself because of society and you have to deny yourself because of, you know, all of these things and the stuff that you subject yourself to you, yourself, your body, your safety, like you're not operating in love. So I believe in any facet of life, if you can't be your authentic self, that something is not right, that we need to do some kind of course correct. And, you know, if you have to distance yourself from certain people in your life and stuff like that in order for you to live that life, now you know you can't do that when you're young. And so you put yourself into these situations that Jules put in and that whole thing with Cal and all that stuff. We'll get into that a little later because that kind of had a little effect a little later on. But I really, um, really connected with Jules and Kat's um, storyline because it's, it felt especially real and grounded. Now, this whole stuff with uh, Maddie and Nate and all, it, it kind of felt a little superficial. And, you know, it was like, yeah, we already know that. I mean, we've seen that in other teen dramas, but I like the stuff that they were hitting on because I feel like it is the stuff that is often overlooked when we're talking about teen stories. It's the, it's the stuff that, you know, because society is not about that. So we put it back here and we're not going to talk about plus size women and we're not going to talk about um, sex work and we're not going to talk about validation and the LGBTQ community. We're going to put this back here because we're not just, we're not comfortable. What it has to, male, white, Christian, heterosexual. If it's not upholding these things, then it's wrong. And and that's where that's where it is with that. So um if you think about it, just think about it and just think about the kind of turmoil that people have put themselves through um just in order to to live a life worth living. And that's in their eyes because you know the 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 level of abuse that they, you know, I'm going to digress, but I'm just saying the level of abuse that people put themselves under in order to feel accepted, uh, validated, anything. And <clears throat> I really think that they do a good job in telling that story. So, you know, a lot of people want to compare season one to season two, but I think season two had a totally different vibe. And I don't feel, I don't feel no ways about it. I feel like, yes, I wanted this, but it's not to say that we're not going to get it. I don't want the same old, same old, if that makes sense to you. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Well, it makes sense to me. So, um, you know, I kind of was watching it and I, I like enjoy every episode, like give Zendaya her Emmy. She acted her ass off. Another character that I really, really enjoy in Euphoria is the character of Ali and Ali plays Zendaya's or, um, Rue's, um, who is it? Coach, um, AA, um, mentor, whatever. And when he comes on screen, he be dropping some real, real holy feel. Like I love when he comes and he drops his nuggets and his jewels. And the thing is, is that what I try to tell people about addiction is that you can't love somebody into it. You cannot make them do it. It does not work like that. And I think when we get to the end of season two, we understand that that's just not how it works. 
and it works on the person's own time. Prayerfully, if they get there, they get there. And if they do not, so on and be in peace. And, you know, I, that's all you can say. You know, that is it. Because in life, I learned you can't control other people. All you can do is control yourself. And you have to let go of that. And we're going to get into rules arc now we get into her storyline when we get into her storyline she is like full blown gone pookie chris rock holly bear whatever crackhead insert crackhead here that was rue rue she was on the deep end baby she was gone 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 she done made a deal with a drug dealer to get drugs and, and, and she comes up and say that she's going to put this whole plan together. And Lori was like, that sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and give you $100,000 worth of drugs. I said, what? You going to front her 100000 Baby. Not I say the cat. She was like, oh, no, let's take a zero off of there. Let's start out with 10. Let's start out with 10. So she basically was just trying to find a way to get, like, free drugs, you know, because it's, it's a habit. You know, you don't want to be sitting up there trying to steal, kill, destroy, trying to get the next hit. So then she went and, and I don't know. I, I, she wasn't thinking. I mean, she came up with the master plan to get over on Lori but baby Lori don't look like she playing no game. So I hope you know what you're doing, Miss Thing. And then we get to this whole thing when um Rue actually they do this intervention because she is just like out of control. So Jules and her boy Elliot, was it Elliot? Is his name Elliot? I think his name Elliot told on her told her mother that she got pills she got narcotics and she is on a bender and we trying to save her life she needs help whoop -de -whoop -whoop. so the mom and and rue she tried to jedi mind trick that shit like when i tell you the master class on manipulation gaslighting and other toxic traits and behavior episode i think it was four baby episode four rue took that shit like i said get that bitch all the emmys i'm telling you sweep because when i tell you that bitch look like a real like blown out crackhead running through the streets on a bender trying to get away from her her parents trying to take her to a rehab and all this other stuff and you know they've been going through this stuff with years for years with her and then people was like um i remember hearing somebody saying that they didn't think that um when her mother um was fed up and her mother said if you want to kill yourself, if you want to be a crackhead, so be it. And they talking about it was too fast. It was unearned. I said, bitch, what? Did you just see the hell? Did she just put her through for the last season one? And just, I mean, that, the episode four and five was like the tipping point. And so now, how, how does it get too fast? Like, you know, the, I mean, I digress. You know, that's what people say. That's what I'm saying. Like, when people are like, oh, we don't need this repetitive stuff. But then we got people who's like, well, how did we get here? Like, no. Did, did you see Rue beating her mother ass? Like, I mean, kicking the doors in, like cussing at her, like drop down, drag out fights with her and her sister, turn that house up like a terrorist. That is enough. Like how much abuse. Black people. Please stop tolerating abuse. Period. It don't mean you don't love them. Any less. You just have to stop. Tolerating abuse. Struggle love and all of that thing. You have enough is enough. And yes she was like. You're almost an adult. I got to try to save my other child. If there's a chance, you are spending all of my energy towards you. So if 
you not going to give me no act right and you going to do what you want to do. I have to wash my hands of you because at the end of the day, I can only control me and me running behind you is not going to work for me no more. I have to try to save my other baby. Period. That's it. That's all. And you have to really come to that decision a little faster sometimes because sometimes people need the tough love and some people need to hit a place, a rock bottom where not, they're not being enabled to continue the cycle. You have to drop them and let them fall where they are and let them pick up the pieces however they do it. And you see once she did that and a little help from Lexi with her play, we will get there, baby. I could, that is like a highlight of season two. That play, Lexi's play, um, it looked like a damn Broadway play, but it's a high school musical, baby. That's how the white, that's how the white kids do it, baby. They got the cheddar, okay? So she got a Broadway budget. She ain't got the urban budget that we got. <laughs> Period. So yeah, she put on a hell of a production and we are going to get to it. But I just want to tell you, I want to um, kind of explain how we're going about this whole trying to um, understand how um, the mom got to the place where she was choosing um, baby girl over Rue. I forget her name. Um, she's played by Storm Reed, but I can't forget her. And that's another thing. We need more of her. You know, I feel like she's on the back burner, but I think that's the whole point. That is the whole point that she's on the back burner because Rue is is like a terrorist and she's like, oh, like the Tasmanian devil. And you can't get out of her whirlwind and the baby girl's on, on the outskirts. And so I'm glad that they really didn't show it, but they did mention it. So I think I'm hoping that we explored a little more in season three because Storm Reed is definitely a jewel and a talent and I would love to see it. Um, yes. And so the budding, blossoming um, potential relationship between Ali and Rue's mom, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. It looks like um, as far as Ali, it looks like he has probably burnt all his bridges with his former family um, due to his addiction. And that is a consequence that you have to live with, unfortunately. So it's time to move on. OK. And I really like the way, you know, some people say he was real, you know, like intrusive. But I thought it was just enough. I don't think he overstepped. I felt like it was just enough. It was just enough for me where it didn't feel disrespectful. It felt helpful. It felt like a man trying to come in and kind of guide and steer. Not overstep, but guide and steer. Okay. So there's a difference, you know, I, you know, I respect, um, the masculine energy when it is healthy, not when it's the, you know, we're not doing no toxic shit, healthy masculinity. I'm all here for. So a lot of people are like, Oh, you man bash, you man bash baby. I do not hear me and hear me well. Okay. All right. So now that we got that straight. So I'm here for that budding romance and I'm here for the, 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 what is it? Like the transformation of this family unit. And because Rue is, is missing her father so much, not a replacement, no, but something else. You see what I'm saying? All right. So anyway, Moving on, um, what storyline do I want to go to next? Okay, baby, let's just go to this play. <laughs> no, no, no. Before we get to the play, I'm going to get to the part where Lexi and Fez is getting into this, like, this relationship, this situationship. And I wouldn't say it's a situationship because I feel like it's very, very innocent. And I feel like there are no other entanglements that's kind of doing nothing you know what i'm saying so 
them genuinely getting closer and closer and closer. And I love to see it. I'm so glad that Lexi is opening up and living her life instead of being an observer of life. And I'm so glad that she was able to um, actually do that. You know, it, it felt really, really good um, seeing their relationship blossom into something more. So also too, oh my God, Ashtray. And well, this was during his uh the, the little intro where he ended up killing the drug dealer that they and he ended up killing him. Child, Ashtray is one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. He about that life. <laughs> and that's putting it lightly. So anyway, um, so all of that happened. There's a his partner was so scared. Um, I think his name is Chester. Chester, child, I don't know. Something. And he actually um ended up snitching. And his girlfriend ended up staying with Fez for some reason. I don't know. She it, The shit freaked her out or whatever. And so, some reason, she ended up with Fez and Ashtray or whatever. And, you know, she ended up being a real one. She didn't stick with Chester or whatever his name, Cluster Chester or whatever, about, you know, snitching on them. And she totally turned the thing around. He came in one day and Fez is getting ready for um, Lexi's play. He got the suit on, the tie. He got the roses. I said, come on, Fez. Cole. Yes. That's what I love to see. And so he was in there. And then, you know, they were showing like flashbacks to their little phone calls and everything. And I'm coming out, beat it. I'm going to have the best seat in the house for you and all these things. So it was so cute. But you saw from the previous trailer that something was going to go down. And we saw Fez on the floor with the flashing lights. And we just knew that that was not going to work out the way Lexi or Fez wanted it to work out. And that's exactly what happened. Um, He came in there on some fuck shit. He came in there with an iPhone trying to like bug in the house and trying to get some kind of confession out of Fez or whatever. And so, you know, Fez is like on cloud nine. He's not even, not even paying attention. However, Faye, it was like, it was her, it was her facials. It was, you know, because Ashtray, I don't even think he had no dialogue at all. And to his credit, he did that shit because for him not to have no dialogue at all through the whole season, but you understood like where his mindset was and how he goes hard and what it is. And he ain't never scared. Kudos to him. So he gets in there and he's looking at Faye and he like, that shit don't look right. Something looks suspect. He grabs the blade, tucks that joint and just sits on the couch. And he's just like. Like he know something is going on. Like he know Faye is, is, is on his own, doing his own thing or whatever. He was like, just, you know what? I'm about to hold it down. So he's sitting up there holding it down. Like he do. And <clears throat> man, when he started talking about Mouse, they found Mouse body, ashtray eyes perked up, his head he sat up. He was like, the next thing you know, soon as soon as he said that, Faye dropped the glass down into the um kitchen floor and made it break and so she went to pick it up and she looked at Fez going she was like this and so Fez he got the he got he understood he understood what was going on and then 
baby. <laughs> I don't know what kind of signal, but Ash ain't get no signal. All he knew is the nigga was flaw and he about to get got because snitches get stitches. And that's exactly what he got. He got that one stitch to the neck. Man, Fez was like, oh my God, he jumps over there and try to cover his mouth so you can't hear him gurgling and they didn't put the phone in the water and all this other stuff. It was a hot ass mess. But because they were listening already, the damage had already been done. And Fez trying to think fast on his feet. He hits his brother. He's like, we got to make it look real. He was like, give me the knife. I'm going to go now. You're not going to go now. I'm going to do this. And and Ashtray was like, nah, nah, you ain't going to do this. You ain't going to do this. And it was just mayhem and just chaos and mayhem. He going to tell him to take his ass in the bathroom, wash his hands. And by the time the police come in here, you going to say that I did it and you didn't do nothing and, you know, whatever. And he got the story together, whatever. Next thing you know, Ashtray goes to the stash, which was the dryer for the washing machine, the dryer, and goes and, and gets all this artillery, like AK-47s, Glocks, and I mean, grenade. you thought this nigga went to war. He goes to put the shit in the bathtub. He gets in the bathtub. I was like, look, and then the irony of him starting out, I told you that we're going to bookend it. He started out in the sink, in the kitchen, and he ended up losing his life in the tub, in the bathroom. So that was a little, um, you know, tie in thread or whatever. And um, it was really, really bad. He started, okay, so the, when the police came in, they had like the, the thing that smoked up the house and they got all the gear on. So the, it was SWAT. It wasn't even like, <laughs> it wasn't even like regular cops. I mean, it was the SWAT team. So it was crazy in there. And then next thing you know, Ashtray starts shooting. He shoot Fez in the stomach. I said, oh my God, Fez goes down. He's screaming, trying to tell the police. And you know, it's pandemonium in there. And so he's screaming, trying to tell the police, it's a kid in there. It's a kid in there. It's a kid in there. And he's screaming to the top of his lungs to tell Ashtray, no, don't do it. No, don't do it. I was like, oh, my God. Baby, when I tell you in the most G- and the most tragic way possible, this actually turned out to be so, you know, the police always wait till all the rounds are done. So, you know, and when it was quiet, you know, they was just kind of sitting around the thing, letting him use all his um his ammo. And then it got quiet because, you know, he got re-up. He got to, you know, put, you know, reload. And so that's when they went in again. And then, you know, all of these things. So then they, you know, they think that he's um, done, quiet, either dead or whatever. And so he goes into the thing and Ashtray looks like he's dead. He's playing dead. And, you know, the police is like, okay, we got one down or whatever. And then next thing you know, Ashtray pops up and shoots the man right here in the neck, through and out. <sighs> Baby. And that was all she wrote. All you saw was that red dot laying right there. You heard the gunshot. Fez is in the hall looking and witnessing the whole entire thing. And when I tell you the hurt and the pain that was in his face, they acted their ass off in that. That shit looked real as hell. They acted their ass off in there. And it was it was a really hard scene to watch. I'm glad that they didn't really show um, him getting shot like that because he was a minor. And, you know, it's just something. I mean, I, I think when you insinuate it, that's enough. But a lot of times people say there is a theory. We didn't see a body. So there's that but 
the type of trauma that Fez is going to actually have to deal with is astronomical. It is just going to be crazy. Like, all of this stuff happened. I think the grandmother is still there in the bed, still alive. Faye is still alive. They take him off. You know they're going to have to take him to a hospital to get him treated. But he will be as a criminal. So he will be chained and cuffed to the, the hospital bed. They will treat him or whatever. But it's not going to be a walk in the park. Um, unless he has his story together. Um, a dead man can't tell no tales. Ashtray wasn't going to tell nothing anyway. So, um, you know, I'm just assuming that the best thing for Fez would to be you know, kind of, I don't know, it, it, it didn't, doesn't feel right to try to blame it on him, but at the same time, it's plausible because you just saw what he did, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, it's just going to be, it's going to be a hard thing for him to, you know, come to terms to do. And, um, you know, I feel really, really bad for him. I felt really, really bad for Lexi. Okay, so let's get into I ain't mean to go to when I start saying Lexi. Let's get into this play, baby. The play started in the penultimate episode, okay? And that's when all the shit hit the damn fan, baby. Oh, my God. When they cut to that part about Nate, baby, I was not ready. Do you hear me? I was not ready. But when I tell you the shit is spot on, like if you look at it, y'all, listen, this is this, this echo chamber that men and masculinity reside in. And, you know, they try to practice hyper masculinity, but at the same time, they don't want to hold each other accountable. And, you know, they always want to blame women for everything, every little problem that they have, right? So then they want to have this little circle, this little fraternization between men. And so it's like this echo chamber of, I mean, I'll, listen, what I'm telling you, it's not like, it, it's more like they just, they got their selves. They, they don't have, they have themselves, you know, they, they, they protect each other. They make sure that, you know, we ain't talking bad about them. We don't hold each other accountable. We see bad behavior. You don't say nothing. I mind my business, you know, the some, not all. You some, not all. But yeah, you, you some niggas don't be saying nothing about the other people. And so this toxic type thing, it trickles down to the children, to the women of the community. And then you wonder why we keep trying to beat our chest because you keep stepping on us. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like one of those type things. But when I tell you, hear me and hear me well, when he depicted, when Sam Levinson put that that whole Nate um, sequence together, That's how it looked to me. I don't know. That's how it looked. Like if you look, like if you start looking on panels, look on panels and look how the men talk and how even when they say some fucked up shit, how they still don't kind of hold them accountable. No, they don't call them on their shit. They may say something, but it's gonna be like, mm, get me. Listen, listen. Everybody got a goddamn mic. Listen to the men, the men's circles. Don't support them. Don't be sitting up there sending super chats to the to the dummies trying to get validation, women. I'm talking to y'all. And then uh, I can't tell men what to do. Like I said, you'll see. Look at that. Listen to the words to the song. Listen to what is going on in the sequence. And that is exactly what masculinity looks like. It looks like they like each other, but they don't like women. That's why they don't like nothing feminine. All they like is masculine. You be wondering how they, how they, how they ever like women because they act like they hate women. You know what I'm saying? And they can find all types of faults within women, but they can never say nothing about themselves. Nothing nothing and there are a few people who will reject it you know socialization say lean into masculinity and y'all 
y'all my cheese mold stuff or whatever y'all do that but there are a couple people who reject that actually and so those are people like that there are people there but like i said they are so few and far between the, all the other people are in this other echo chamber where they keep on like oh oh and this person be real toxic up here and, and, and just saying all this stupid shit and then but I ain't gonna say nothing, you know. Oh, that's my man and him. That's my man. That's they they promote them, they they support them, they do this, they do that. No oil on my back, I can't reach my pecs again too freaking big. Anything for you, Jake. Hey Jake, your body's fantastic. Can I help? <laughs> Just look at me. Just look at it. Look at it. And be open minded. I'm trying. It is a true depiction of masculinity. I'm trying to tell you. When I tell you, I was screaming to the top of my lungs watching the Nate segment of the play. Baby, I was not ready. I was not ready. But anyway. More over than that, we get to the part and Cassie is like mad. too bad like Lexi I don't think Lexi kind of put her on front street about too much the thing that pissed Cassie off is the Nate segment which caused Nate to walk out run out and break up with her and you know that's her end all be all right so yeah so when he broke up with her and I'm just like you know that shit is fake how many times have y'all broken up how many times you just seen him break up and make up with Maddie like that's some kind of fucking ping pong carousel girl get off the carousel you remember when they showed her when she was on that carousel and she had that little the big O or whatever and she was mad she ran up on the stage and pulled the girl off the carousel child that was a hot ass mess and when she did that Maddie was like oh no we need to put this bitch down she gets up and she runs and then cat gets up and she running to the stage oh my god it was a mess but i loved it i loved every minute of it when she chased cassie ass down them steps and pushed that bitch girl i thought it was gonna be a blood stain on the wall because she pushed that bitch so hard into that damn wall bitch Y'all, when I tell you that mess, that was the coup de gras 
of the season. It was really, really entertaining. It was really good. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I'm going to try to wrap it up a little bit. Uh, we get to uh, Lexi's part, and she's kind of telling Rue's story um, with a soft-colored lens because I don't think Lexi has not been privy to the terrorism and the the Tasmanian devil niche that she was been, you know, doing at home, the stuff that she's been doing at home. So she has a different type a of a, a gaze of Rue. And so when she depicted this play, which I think if you watch the season as a whole, it comes together so poetically and so nicely that it just kind of like made sense. And so if you can look at it as a whole, I think... You know, aside from the differences that I already said, Cat Storyline, McKay, and all that, if you look at it as a whole, it was a beautifully told story. And Rue got what she needed from the depiction of that story that Lexi saw her in the manner that she saw her in. And so it gave her hope that she could actually be that person since she has like a living person. Like, it, you know, if somebody sees me as good, then maybe I can see myself that maybe that's good enough for me to be to be clean. And, you know, people just need a glimmer of hope. You just need some hope. And so I think they did a beautiful job in, in writing that. Uh, Elliot had this beautiful song that he sung and it's very, very transparent. If you listen to the words, it all kind of correlates to the story of Rue. Jules, her mom, her father's relationship, their relationship, it all centered around Rue and the different relationships that she held with everybody. And, you know, some sometimes you got to say bye. Sometimes you got to love yourself. Sometimes you got to do this and we'll meet again. This is not the right time. It was a beautiful song. Went on a little too, too, little too long, but I appreciate it. I'm just going to tell you that I appreciated the song. I listened to it. A couple of times, I actually were rounded back just to listen to the words, um, because you know I journal a lot. I, I, I talk through my feelings. I work through my feelings by journaling, and so I wanted to make sure I definitely got these, um, the the lyrics down so I can understand what it was saying and the meaning behind it. And it was so powerful, and it was just it was such a beautiful piece and anyway so let's um move on and i think the last thing i really want to touch on is cow he left that house in a disarray peed on the damn floor pissed on the floor left his family gave them the big f you and this big horrible speech and i was just like So they actually gave Cal a backstory too. And not, not to show or to justify his actions and things that he did. It is just giving you a glimpse of the things that happens in life and the choices and the consequences that you make by not living your authentic self and how all of it trickles down and bleeds and spills over that messiness bleeds and spills over into everybody's life. And he did not do good by anybody in that family. Nobody, especially Nate, especially not his wife. Um, and definitely not himself. He didn't honor himself, but at the end of the day, I still felt like he took the selfish route after he created all this turmoil and toxicity and, and, and trauma. And then he wants to turn around and just be like, fuck it. I'm about to go live my life. And Nate was like, no, 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 no. You don't get, he was like, he asked him, was he happy? And he was like, I'm happier, happier, not happy, happier. He's trying to live in his truth and all this other stuff. And Nate was like, oh no. Mm -mm. that's not how any of this works. He was like, you don't get to fuck up all of us, our family, our life, and all this shit, and then you think you're going to ride off into the sunset and be happy? 
Oh, no! No thanks. Come close. Police outside. I said, oh, they did it. But you know, in essence of him doing that, it's still going to hit him. A lot of times when you make hard choices later on in life, trying to correct something, it's still, it, you're still going to get hit by proxy. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, even though you, you know, Nate, you may think it was a, a bad decision on Nate, or it was a decision that was just like, it, it's still not going to be better. I feel like having a, trying to clear the conscious and clear the energy and clear, you know, the secrets away can kind of start over to build something new. So I, they may be trying to go for a redemption arc with Nate, but I ain't touching it. I ain't touching it. We'll get there when we get there. But, you know. Yeah. So, anyway. That's it for me. That is um, the end of this. It wasn't a play-by-play, y'all. Don't say it was a play-by-play. -play. I'm telling you. It was not. I try to go through every character in their arc or whatever. And try to touch on the resolve and the important parts of it and, you know, what it meant on a deeper level for me and through my perspective and my experience and my, you know, just knowledge and reading and all that, all those things. Um, just human nature is very, very messy. It's very, very complex. And um, a lot of people have a lot of learning unlearning, reprogramming, relearning different things that line up with their self, something that honors them, their, their value system. And so, um, not your parents value system, not your spouse or your mate's value system, not society's value system, your created yourself. You are the creator of your emotions. You're the creator of your life. Take your life by. I think before high school, we should think about all the things we don't like about ourselves and then change them. So it can be like, like different, cooler. By the ropes and guide it where you want it to go. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm saying this to you just like I'm saying it to me. I say it to myself every day. A lot of times people are like, why are you saying I am every day? I say I am every day on Twitter, um, a part of my affirmations. Everything that I need to be, that is what I am. So, you know, sometimes just because I don't, you know, tell you what I am, don't mean I'm not saying it and pouring it into myself and into the universe or whatever. So that's just a little nugget for me and i just want everybody to kind of like kind of digest it all you know what i'm saying like i think that what sam is doing is is actually giving us a piece of the underbelly um and make you appreciate it in a different manner if that makes any sense so <laughs> So anyway, if I missed anything that you want to talk about, let's get down in the comments. Leave a comment. Leave a like. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm trying to get to 5,000 subs. I'm a small YouTuber, but I really enjoy what I do. I'm going to keep trying to come to you as much as possible. I may not have any notes. I might be going off the dome, but I'm going to try to get my thoughts out to you and keep on producing this great content. I like it somebody out there will connect to it. And if it's you, I appreciate you. So see you back in season three, which I heard is in 2024. Can you confirm? Put it down in the comments. If not, then I see you, you for your people later in 2024. Peace.